Hello, I'm Baba Kepasade, CEO of Toronto Center for Global Leadership and Financial Supervision. Welcome to our discussion on Building Back Better, the road to COP26. Today, we once again look at the role of supervisors in supporting national climate change strategies. Just a quick word about Toronto Center. Since our inception in 1998, we have trained more than 15,000 central bankers and supervisors from 190 countries and territories to build more stable, resilient, and inclusive financial systems. In 2016, we began incorporating climate change in our programming because of the substantial implications to global financial stability and risk of crisis from climate change. Because climate change is a global challenge, it is vital that central banks and supervisory authorities contribute to their nation's climate strategy to turn their jurisdictions more resilient. This is also an ongoing international concern in line with the undertaking of the network of greening the financial systems, which is composed of 94 central banks and supervisory authorities. In the aftermath of the devastating impact of global pandemic on economies and people's livelihoods, this proactive crisis preparedness is essential for all countries to mitigate against the impact of climate shocks. So it's no longer just about credit. A crisis can come from anywhere and affect everything. It is my honor to welcome our two distinguished speakers. They're leading their nation's supervisory efforts to tackle these challenges and our great international influences. I do not have time to read their bios because it would take a full hour. Their, uh, their accomplishments are too many, but you have received their bios. Unar Gunnar Stottir is Deputy Governor for Financial Supervision, Central Bank of Ireland. And I've also discovered that she was in Toronto for a couple of years attending one of our prestigious law schools. Thomas Soleil is superintendent of the General uh, Superintendency of Insurance of uh, Costa Rica or SUGESE. Toronto Centre's mission is generously supported by Global Affairs Canada, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, the IMF, Jersey Overseas Aid, Comic Relief, and the USAID. In fact, I was looking at the list of participants and I hope our friend uh, Kerry Max from GAC is here. I saw his name. So hello, Kerry, if you are. I would also like to thank my team of Demet, uh, Demet Kanakchat and uh, Ashley Thompson and um, Haley Love, who worked so hard to bring this program to you. We will have three rounds. I will pose three questions alternating between each speaker, and then I will take questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A tab to submit your questions. All I ask is that your questions please be brief because there won't be a lot of time to read long questions. Unur, I'm wondering if I can start with you. And yeah. welcome, welcome to our program. Thank you. Iceland's uh, priority targets reflect the government's emphasis on SDG action with respect to climate change, SDG 13. What are your objectives and challenges at the national level? What role does the central bank have in reaching those objectives? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, the Icelandic government has ambitious targets on meeting the Paris Agreement, such as reducing greenhouse gas by 55% from 1990 to 2030. Uh, we are uh, in coalition with Norway and EU on this. And Iceland, um, to, man, to name another target, uh, Iceland aims to be carbon neutral by 2040. Uh, so what are the main challenges? Um, I would say that the main challenges uh, to reach these goals are with regard to transportation, uh, mainly the fleet of the fishing vessels, as we are a, a, a big uh, fishing nation. Uh, the challenge is the transition of energy uh, uh, as the fishing vessels, they're now using diesel and they're not so easy to change into being run, in, uh, run on electricity. But the industry is looking into hydrogen for this. Apart from transportation, Iceland is mainly using renewable energy already and has been for a long time. We are not dependent on fossil fuels to heat our houses, so uh, there's a challenge to, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by such a large percentage as 
as we start from a relatively good place with, with a lot of renewable energy. Uh, what's the role of the central bank? Um, it has a wide mandate. Uh, it's an integrated central bank as a monetary authority, as well as an authority for financial stability and financial supervision. And the supervisory mandate is as wide as it gets. Uh, we're responsible for regulating and supervising all uh, the financial services sectors, the banks, the insurance uh, companies, uh, the pension funds and the securities markets. So you don't see, we don't see direct references to the role of the central bank in Iceland's priority targets as such. But uh, we in the central bank are committed to supporting the government's objectives in every way we can. And it's already uh, very high on our agenda. Uh, and as for the, for the uh, supervisory part, uh, financial institutions play, play a key role financing the transition to renewable energy and a more sustainable economy so the supervisor is an important standard setter. Thomas, uh, let me switch to you and we go back to Unur in a second. First of all, uh, you're a very good friend of Toronto Center. We have worked with your agency and your sister agencies in Costa Rica. And we find that your officials are very engaged in capacity building. And also you play a very big role in Latin America as the head of the insurance association, ASAL, but also in your country, you're very active and engaged. Let me ask you this question. Uh, climate change is also at the top of the Costa Rican government agenda. Can you tell us a bit about Costa Rica's climate change strategy and the role of SUHESA, your agency, in your national climate change strategy, please? Sure, thank you very much, Babak. First of all, thank you for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to have this conversation with you. Uh, Costa Rica, in, in 2019, it was honored with the Champions of the Earth Award. That is the U U United Nations highest environmental recognition for its strong vocation in the protection of the environment and ambitious policies to combat climate change. The leadership of environment commitment of my country has so huge historical roots. It is based on the foundations of human development established by constitution since 1949, uh, Costa Rica is a middle income country with the oldest democracy and a strong democracy in Latin America. And also it is the country that decided to abolish the army more than 70 years ago in order to finance the universal education and health system. Um, it is remarkable that the last six years, Costa Rica generated more than 98% of its electricity in a renewable way. Uh, and the last 25 years, the country stopped the, the, the deforestation. And today, almost 60% of, of the land is once again forest. So uh, this is Costa Rica, my country, a, a climate champion. And with that, a background, let me summarize the main ideas about Costa Rica's climate change strategy with three main components. Uh, first, ambitions commitment. Second, a strong pu public policy. And third, uh, a net benefit estimation. Uh, let me move on the first one. Uh, the country presented the context in the context of the Paris Agreement, the most ambitious national determined contribution NDC in 2015. Despite this, in December 2020, Costa Rica informed a more ambitious commitment and aligned it with the global goal of average increased temperature to 1.5. It is clear that ambition commitment needs a an, an strong public policy. And that is the second component. Costa Rica climate change strategy could be explained by two central policy instruments. First, the National Decarbonization Plan 2019-2050, which established long-term mitigation measures, and the National Adaptation Policy 2018-2030, that defines short and medium-term policy action for adaptation. Finally, the full implementation of decarbonization plan has been estimated uh, that could bring 
41 billion USA, USA dollars in net benefit to the economy by 2050. So Costa Rica's climate change strategy includes mid and long term targets to reform transport, agriculture, energy, waste and land use. One of the most important aspects to consider in, the, in this is the just transition approach that seeks to maximize the creation of decent jobs and sustainable businesses, minimize job destruction, and promote the generation of green jobs. This strat strategy also incorporates a gender focus in the intervention. So uh, through uh, these instruments, the country's agenda had been defined and some action were incorporated. Uh, finally, let me talk a little about what is uh, success for in this strategy and what could be the main concerns. There are some topics that are extremely important to care about. Uh, first, the first one is uh, the climate protection gap that appears to be worse because of a slow adaptation action and more fre frequent and extreme weather uh, events. Uh, currently, less than 5% of the total losses uh, have been insured, the, the total losses from, from an, an, an climate event here in Costa Rica. And in this context, you have approved a new inclusive, inclusive insurance regulation and also clarified regulate, re regulatory issues in relation to the development index in insurance. Uh, second, the supervisor responsibility to warn the market about this risk of climate change. In that sense, an open discussion and training groups on climate risk were organized by insurer and banking supervisors. Since the beginning of 2020, the banking and insurance sector have set up their own working groups and are so active. And finally, it is critical to have a coordinated work between the financial regulators and the central bank. Uh, we, we just began this, this uh, close coordination uh, with the uh, creation of, of, of a, 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 a working group uh, with the bank, central bank and all the superintendents here in Costa Rica. But, but I, 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 I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Actually, you, your explanation was very interesting. In fact, uh, we may come back to that in a second about some of that cross-sectoral coordination and cooperation. And I think some in you know, our audience probably got notice of the fact that although we're talking about climate change, it is really uh, astonishing and uh, interesting that Costa Rica abolished its military such a long time ago, given the region you're in. So we, we like to learn about that too, but that goes beyond the mission of Toronto Center. So that's for another conversation over beer maybe, but I'm, next time I'm in San Jose. Hey, we have Unor back. Hi, Unor, how are you? Hi, I'm glad to be back. This was a rather alarming because uh, the the somehow the net uh, <laughs> died. It didn't. It, it failed. The the no internet of the central bank. We always love to have a little bit of the excitement in our program. <laughs> yes. So, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say, or do you think you completed your talk? Uh, I think I, I think I'm. I think I I had completed what I uh, sort okay. of uh, in substance what I wanted to say. Okay, so we'll come back to that as well, because there's a lot of interesting things and I see questions already being asked. So, um, put you on the spot again, uh, it's your turn uh, again. Oh, okay. <laughs> last, <clears throat> last December, uh, the Iceland Central Bank joined the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS, uh, along with some other organizations. What kind of supervisory actions have you taken to, climate, uh, to combat climate change so far? Um, yeah, first I want to mention greenwashing. Uh, the, the, the banks uh, or, and other financial institutions uh, have started promoting their greening policy. Uh, an example that comes to mind is uh, one of our major banks has granted honors to companies for sustainability. Uh, so this is a big marketing issue for them or, and for the insurance companies. So uh, it's, a, it's a role for the supervisor to carry out, uh, carry out checks, whether they're living up to their, up to their promising, promises and not mis-selling brown products for green. Uh, that, that's one uh, issue that we are 
uh, very well aware of looking into. Uh, in the securities market division, we have seen in, in prospectuses that some issuers are more advanced than others in their greening efforts. Uh, um, the, the National Energy Company is an example of good practice as an issuer of bonds. They've set measurable targets with, with regard to climate, promising higher interest rates on their bonds if they fail to reach the targets. So it's a trade-off that they're offering uh, the, uh, their, uh, their investors. Uh, we in the central bank, we don't have a clear mandate in combating greenwashing in securities or as yet, but we are very well of this, very aware of this uh, risk or danger. Um, Direct climate risk on portfolios is another issue. Uh, we have requested reports from the banks on how they're assessing climate related risk, especially for the credit risk. Uh, we're currently analyzing those reports. Some stress testing has already been taking place to evaluate the resilience to natural disasters. Um, I want to mention uh, as uh, um, Iceland is an associated state to the EU, uh, so we're obliged to homogeneity in legislation and practice. Uh, exactly one year ago, uh, the so-called taxonomy regulation entered into force in the European Union. This taxonomy regulation sets out um, an EU-wide framework, it's a classification system, uh, according to which investors and businesses can assess whether uh, certain economic, economic activities are sustainable. So it's sort of a dictionary of what activities may or may not be called sustainable. So this is sort of a standard that we have been waiting for and, and, and now it's already in place. This, this uh, taxonomy regulation, it's it it's provides a common language to, to identify environmentally sustainable activities and financial instruments. And it's supposed to be used by the invest by investors, the financial institutions uh, and issuers. Uh, so this will definitely provide us, as I said before, uh, with an additional tool to combat climate change and, uh, and promote, um, and promote a more sustainable financial market. So these are sort of issues that I wanted to mention in this respect. That's great. Anna. And I'm still with you. I'm glad, glad about that. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, no, it's very interesting. I mean, I was just listening to what you said earlier on, which is greenwashing. I'm so glad that you're taking that on. Like, and you're seeing that all the time. Like ESG is such a popular thing. Mm -hmm. And if you just do a casual look at the investment uh, products out there, mutual funds or exchange traded funds ETFs. sometimes you see that a fund that's branded as, the, as ESG has an MER that's 10 times more than a regular basic index and yet the, I, the constituent parts are nearly identical you know so you can on the one hand go and beat up a bank and then come and put the same bank in an ESG fund right so it's very good that you're doing that and it speaks to disclosure G7 itself made disclosure, you know, said they're backing the mandatory implementation of disclosure. So it's very good. This is actually important that you mentioned that. And uh, so let's uh, move on there to the next question for Tomas. Tomas, in your, as your role as the head of the insurance uh, sector supervisor in Costa Rica, do you think uh, climate change affects certain sectors of the financial industry more than others? What are your thoughts on this? And the background to this question is as an insurance supervisor, you guys have really been at the forefront of this for a very, very long time, right? It's not a new topic for you, but now you're seeing your brothers and sisters from other sectors coming in other companies and this whole financial sector is so integrated. So what are your thoughts on this question? Thank you, Baba. Okay. So it's, it, of course, that is a crucial question for financial supervisor. And uh, in the case of Costa Rica, when we must uh, coordinate with uh, a, another three uh, services, uh, it's, it is very, very important uh, to, to, to have this uh, clear. Uh, in my opinion, uh, climate change uh, related, related risk affects some of the financial sector differently and more intensely compared to others. 
Uh, nevertheless, of course, there are some of the risks that could affect all sectors without difference. So um, let me divide uh, the analysis in two questions. How do physical and transition risks affect the economy? And are there different impacts of for certain financial services? Uh, so let me elaborate a, a little bit. Um, first, it is clear that physical and transition risk correspond to the purest concept of climate risk. For instance, understanding how those risks are transmitted to the economy is essential and how that a new, new reality of the economy is transmitted to the balance sheet uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, the critical uh, topic. Uh, in one hand, the science predicts for physical risk greater severity and frequency of weather events. If there are no climate plans in it, it is if there are no climate plans in the country or in the world, it will be worse, of course. Uh, some of the expected impacts of to households uh, and businesses are losses of income, property damage, damages, and business interruption. Um, in the case of banking entities, the credit could be aggravated, the credit risk, uh, due to uh, scenarios of greater impact on income of households and businesses. And if for, for non lively insurance, and the rising risk will be aggravated by the degree of volatility and severity of physical risk. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, insurance is, is in the front uh, and will be affected uh, in both, both sides of the balance sheets, uh, in the liability and, and, and of course in the, in the asset uh, part two. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, uh, transition risk is affected for policy and regulation, technology changes and consumer preferences. Uh, in, in this last one, it's is very important that what uh, Anna is say, saying about the, the disclosure and, and the public confidence uh, uh, about the, the greening finance and, and all those topics. Uh, so uh, in the case of transition risk, it is possible to observe restriction from low carbon policies, uh, like we are seeing in our countries, uh, a new capital expenditure for technological transition and um, legal liabilities. Uh, there is possible to find some opportunities as uh, the green bonds and green financing in, in our countries, but there are some new risks too. Uh, uh, market risks and liquidity risks must be assessment, assessment and, and must be uh, uh, analyzed in this uh, new uh, in, in, in on this new new reality of our countries so there are a continuous climate and economic effects and, and continuous economy and financial system feedback effects uh, the financial supervisors must be aware that climate change related risks represent a serious threat to the solvency and the stability of the financial markets and there are asymmetrical effects for different financial services. Uh, for us in Costa Rica, uh, th these first steps to coordinate all the ser financial services are really, really important in order to have a, a, a integrated and, and, and a roadmap that will be a, a more consistent. Um, so I, I think that uh, we can, I, I think that uh, that that is uh, true, and, and we we cannot ignore it for much longer. Um, it's time, definitively, to take to get, take ac actions uh, about those those topics. Uh, thank you, Babak. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Uh, next question uh, goes to Unur. Um, Unur, um, you know what the MIT Green Futures Index is, but let me explain to our participants: it's a ranking of 76 leading countries and territories under progress and commitment towards building a low carbon future. So it's a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, global index. According to, the, to this index uh, from the MIT, Iceland ranked number one in the overall rankings amongst the examined economies with regards to certain pillars used in the research, carbon emissions, uh, energy uh, transition, green society, clean innovation, and climate policy. Sounds like it's the Oscars. You got the Oscars in um, green. Good for yeah. you. And this is your acceptance speech, I guess, but hopefully a shorter acceptance speech. 
What powers and tools can financial supervisors use in addressing climate-related financial risks? How are you encouraging environmental risk analysis by financial institutions in Iceland? I mean, I imagine being such a progressive country, having done so much, there's a lot more pressure on your banks, right? Than in some other countries, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't really know about that, but uh, uh, <clears throat> the powers and tools that we have, um, being, being a risk-based supervisor, uh, we can use all the powers and tools that we have already in store to tackle risk. Uh, but the challenge here is to analyze and evaluate uh, the, the climate-related risk. Uh, in banking, uh, this reflects mainly credit risk and the uh, evaluation of the quality of loans and collateral. Uh, but So this can be directly reflected into the, the capital requirements that are that the supervisor, that we as a supervisor, uh, can, can require the banks. Uh, but there is a job undone in developing and refining our methodology on how to analyze and evaluate these risks. And, and this applies to the market as well, has, how, how they assess the risk. So, so uh, we, we, we need to learn more about this. That's why this taxonomy uh, regulation is also uh, so important to us. Uh, I, I spoke, I, I mentioned stress testing before. That's, uh, that's uh, of course, an important tool um, with regard to insurance. Uh, there's, uh, it's important to evaluate the potential protection gap that we see increasing globally. And uh, while nations can, can uh, look into maybe political initiatives to fill this, this protection gap, by, by providing state insurance. Iceland as, a, as an island of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, avalanches and, and such disasters, we have such uh, state insurer in Iceland and, and we are grateful for that. We've had it for a long time. Um, we are participating uh, in a European uh, project uh, to evaluate potential risk to financial stability. Uh, so it's not only sort of uh, classical supervisory, but also the financial stability um, uh, focus on it caused, caused by, by recent uh, catastrophes that have been happening in uh, Europe, uh, so, such as forest fires and floods and war. Uh, the, the disasters in Iceland are maybe not as typical as in, in uh, as the as the same same catastrophes as, as we see in other countries uh, pension funds are extremely important in Iceland their assets amount to double the GDP so their investments are crucial for the economy in in the legislation that they abide to they are supposed they are supposed to invest by ethical standards as it says. This is, of course, rather open to interpretation, but the funds, they generally use the ESG principles as guidance for, for, for what is ethical standards. Uh, however, the pension funds are required to, adopt, uh, to opt for 3.5% real interest on their portfolios. So they can get into a dilemma deciding to invest in brown shares or bonds with higher interest rates rather than, than uh, green with lower. But then also they, they might have the possibility as, as such an important investor to, to influence uh, businesses to, to become greener. So this is, this is an actual uh, uh, discussion in Iceland. So uh, overall, we have some tools already in place, uh, but we still need to improve by the, the criteria and the methodology and, and, and learn from, from real life. That's what I wanted to say on this one. That's great. And uh, Unur, I used to work for a very large uh, institutional investor, the Canada Pension Fund Investment Board. So I'm kind of familiar with these ethical dilemmas that you're talking about, because uh -huh. on the one hand, we all want to be ethical. We all want to do this. But then where do you draw the line, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you say, I have had enough of ethicals. And then what happens to that return? So no, it's a very tough balance. 
Uh, Thomas, you get the last structured questions, then we go to the audience. Um, uh, you are the president of the Supervisory Association for Latin American Insurers, ASAL, and I had the pleasure to talk to ASAL just before the pandemic. I was probably one of the last speakers there in an actual setting. Um, what are the supervisory and industry practices in the regions with regards to addressing climate-related financial risks and what needs to be done now? When I'm asking you this question, I'm not asking you to opine on specific countries. But just in general, as you observe that, what do you see? Thank you. Thank you, Babake, for this question. Um, are you, uh, as you know, uh, Latin America is an uh, interesting region and so diverse and asymmetric. Uh, there are some differences of uh, the economic and social development, and but, uh, but also regarding the insurance market, Latin America shows challenges on the supervisory practices. Um, ASAL had become a space for exchange and discussion of experience throughout the region. And we, we are maintaining a, a permanent dialogue with the IIIS, uh, NAIC, and AIOPA for, say, some of the uh, main uh, uh, insur uh, insurance associations uh, in order to keep supervisory practice updated. Uh, since the Costa Rica's market opened in 20, uh, 2008, uh, we have found in ASAL and some of the, uh, the, the members, members a very valu valuable space for exchanging experiences and supervisory practices. And I am sure it is the same for the supervisory community in the, community in the region. Uh, for uh, the climate change, uh, related risk uh, will, will, will not be uh, different. Uh, uh, however, the region has great challenges on this path of adopting better supervisory practices. And the last years, there has been a regional effort, uh, effort to increasingly adopt better practices. Uh, I am interested in highlighting four important regulatory advances in the region. Uh, first, uh, the implementation of risk-based supervision frameworks in some countries. Uh, in my opinion, this has been one of the most important ch changes in supervisory practices in, the, in Latin America. Uh, the countries that have uh, completed the implementation uh, have observed not notable improvements in the quality of corporate governance and risk management uh, in their market. And for instance, uh, in the stability and security of these markets. Uh, second, uh, we have a, a, a huge uh, a challenge uh, uh, in the near future that is the adoption of IFRS 17. Uh, the adoption of this accounting standard introduces very profound changes for both the supervisor uh, entities and, and the uh, insurance companies. And third, uh, the improvements of risk-based capital regimes. Uh, some jurisdiction uh, will be waiting to consolidate, consolidate some of the, of the uh, co corporate govern governance and, and, and risk assessment uh, in the risk-based supervision. And some of the ch changes in IFRS 17 uh, before uh, uh, beginning this kind of, 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 of uh, improvement. Uh, and last, uh, Baba, uh, the adoption of, of business conduct models and, and, and new uh, uh, regulation uh, in regard of, of uh, closing the, 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 the protection gap uh, and, and being more accessible, accessible the, 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 the insurance in, in our market. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to address the SDG challenges and climate change. Um, I am so happy to inform you uh, that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the ASAL uh, Board of Directors created the Working Group for Sustainability and Climate Change. Uh, and on next August, we will continue these discussions uh, in the first high-level meeting of in sustainable insurance in Latin America. This event uh, is organized by ASAL and A2II and will allow us to define the roadmap and next steps. Uh, the region uh, uh, we are we have in the region uh, that some some of the supervisors have uh, 
take advantage uh, in, in some of the topics. Uh, they are uh, talking, uh, with, they are having a, an open talk, talk, uh, talk conversation with, with the industry and they are fixing their, their expectations uh, in, uh, and hearing uh, the, the, the industry uh, concerns too. Um, uh, maybe uh, one of the of the of the important concerns uh, in this moment could be uh, the effects of the pandemic and, and the the needs uh, to 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 uh, begin begin again uh, with more activity in our economies and, and maybe that could be a, a little concern. Uh, what? Uh, how much? Uh, uh, the the climate change could stop that. I think uh, nothing. <laughs> I think uh, we we must to 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 begin the 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 work uh, in order to to uh, be connected with with our public policies and and, and make our our country more resilient uh, and, and put it. In the in the new new reality new normality a growing path. Um, I'm I'm really very excited about the formal incorporation of this topic in the regional agenda. Uh, Babak, I come to you again. Thank you. No, that's great, and I think you have a very uh, interesting opportunity and a big challenge as well because man, there are many countries in your region that are very. Uh, are strong producers of natural resources, including petroleum, and some of them. So it's going to be a very interesting dialogue. We see that a lot in Canada, right? Like we have in the province of Ontario, Ontario's economy is as large as Sweden and Denmark combined. And people in Ontario, probably for them, climate change means very different than Saskatchewan and Alberta that are so dependent on natural resources and petroleum. So, you know, those discussions and debates play out all the time. So I suspect would be the same for you. So now let's move to the audience section and uh, let's try to see as we can get as many of them as possible. We have a good list of questions here. I think I'm gonna give the very first question to you, Anar. Ashwabak Keynes asks, what guidance would you give to financial institutions in, in, uh, in the incorporation of climate change risk in their enterprise risk management frameworks? Thank you. Uh, can you repeat the, the beginning of the question? Is it about what advice we would give the... Yeah, what, what guidance would you give to financial institutions as they're incorporating climate change risk uh, as part of their ERM framework? Yeah. Well, sort of broadly speaking, is I, I, I would go into either uh, both learn from experience, you know, avoid other older mistakes in, in evaluating the risk of, of maybe maybe making a mistake of, of uh, granting loans to a polluting uh, industry or something like that but but also um, as I said before um, it's 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 useful uh, to uh, have some, standards so that, that are we have to learn from our own experience but we also have to learn from others that's that's sort of so so for us as a as a, such a small economy if it's very it's a very important uh, backbone to us to be the associated state to the European Union and and learn from from their expertise and initiatives so uh, so I, I don't have a, I don't have a very concrete uh, advice for that so because we are very much in the learning process of this ourselves. Yeah, we're all learning together, right? Yeah so that's the important thing. Yeah. And uh, Thomas, the next question is for you. Please uh, provide a brief overview of the role of supervisors and regulators in climate change risk review of financial institutions. So when you look at the role of supervisors, where, where, where do they add value in that? Um, okay, thank you. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, uh, there, there is a, a very, very important role uh, of supervisors because uh, uh, the, the supervisor must present what are their expectations, expectatives uh, about the uh, 
the climate change rate risk uh, um, assessment from the from the institutions. And uh, if if you have a an, 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 an risk management uh, a risk based supervision approach, it is maybe a little more easy. <laughs> that is because uh, uh, it's possible uh, to to centralize uh, first of all uh, the collect the collecting data and, and centralize uh, the the taxonomy uh, about uh, the, the, the quality of the data uh, that will be uh, important in the case of Costa Rica, uh, be coordinated with all the say, financial services. And secondly, um, it's important to, 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 to share with the, with the uh, financial institutions what are the, what the spe uh, regulatory and supervisory expectations are and, and how uh, we expect they uh, put uh, in their own uh, risk appetite and in their own um, um, risk assessments uh, the way they, they, they will be uh, monitoring and, and, and analyzing this, this, this kind of, 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 of risk. So uh, I, I think it, it is a, a, a huge and important role in order to spread out in, in, in all the market uh, best practices that, that we're seeing uh, in, in one entity and, and not in, in, in another, uh, another and give them uh, a lot of feedback about uh, these first steps uh, in, in, in uh, assessing the, the climate risk. Uh, 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 the climate, the climate-related risk uh, in, in our jurisdictions. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me go to back to Unor. Unor, there's a question here from um, a person by name of uh, his, his or her last name is Green, so it's very appropriate, right? So it's a Green person. Maybe they have all the answer. The question is, what is the role of financial services policymakers and supervisors to create a green finance framework in smaller jurisdictions? So I guess the question behind the question is, uh, question is that there's big jurisdictions and he says, he or she says, mega jurisdictions have all these big grand plans. But what happens to small jurisdictions like yours or Tomas's? Like, is, there, is that different? Is that a different challenge, different opportunity? Um, I don't see it as such. Uh, I find that every country has to learn uh, about the dangers and risks that they are facing. And, and some countries are more uh, dependent on, on, on their environment, uh, sort of other countries adjacent to them. Uh, and then, then there are islands like Iceland is. Uh, we have the ocean, we have glaciers that are melting. So we are, uh, we have, uh, we've had massive earthquakes, we have a volcanic eruption going on 50 kilometers from Reykjavik. So uh, we are, it's, uh, to us, it's, it's not just nice to have, to uh, have a uh, measures in place and knowing what what we should do uh, we may need other measures than some bigger countries that are not as volatile one of the one of the uh, things that we have to face as a, a small country is or, or small countries have to have to face that they are usually much more volatile than the than the larger ones so I feel it's it's more or less the same as before. It's uh, we need to stand on our feet and and be realistic on what we're facing each and every country, also the small ones. And although it's it's good and useful for us to learn from the, from the bigger ones, uh, from what they have to contribute. But we but every every country has has to analyze their own situation. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Tomas, for you. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah I, I, I totally agree with uh, Anur and and and, and, and with, with, with the country that my country is so small uh, than, than than Iceland, but uh, it's not uh, it, it's less uh, rich. It's a, a, a middle, middle income uh, country. Um, of course, uh, there are a lot of of learn from each other. Uh, is not possible to to translate uh, an, an, an regulation from a an, an developed country to uh, to to an emerging country uh, 
just in that, uh, because uh, our market are, are small, less development, and, and have a lot of a, a lot of a space to 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 grow up. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, it, 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 there is a, a, a true. Uh, we have faced um, Costa Rica is uh, in the top of the. A country that 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 that, that face a, 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 that are more exposed a, to 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 catastrophic risk in, in the world. Uh, we are in the top ten, I I, I think. Uh, so we have uh, done this this job uh, for for a long time. And if 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 just forget uh, climate change, <laughs> we have done this this the we we have achieved this this. Uh, these goals to 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 have a, a more uh, stable and and, and safe uh, 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 market. Uh, so uh, that uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, the, with, with climate change uh, doesn't uh, change change that uh, that is a situation. Uh, that is only that we must to learn a lot from each other. Maybe we will uh, to to translate. Some of the of the topics of, of the new solvency or, or new uh, risk assessment approach uh, approach uh, depending of our uh, with with a proportionality uh, bias uh, depending uh, of, of our reality and and, and uh, th that that would be the, my comment. Well, I mean, I think it, it underscores the fact that both of your countries are in a very uh, difficult challenge because. You know, there are countries that are climate change makers and there are countries that are climate change takers. The two of you are that. I mean, look at Iceland, surrounded by water, and to us, you guys are between two oceans. Mm -hmm. So every time our polar bears lose their habitat, your water levels go up, right? So at the end of the day, we're all connected. But I take your point. There's no room for uh, climate change mitigation imperialism, right? Everybody has to learn their story, but collaborate on the information together. So it's a good question now uh, from my colleague, uh, good colleague, Prasanna Sashan. If uh, he's talking about carrots and sticks, right? So you can't just mandate things and make him very, uh, you know, prohibitive. So as a supervisor, I guess, Thomas, I'm gonna pass this to you. As a supervisor, what are the carrots and sticks you would employ to motivate and penalize institutions to address climate change, particularly for small and emerging economies? Like what are, do you have carrots or is it all just regulatory sticks? I guess that's the question. <laughs> no, I, I, I think the, 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 the world changes with, with, uh, when, 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 when you uh, 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 put in practices uh, the, the risk-based supervision. And uh, the, the, the most important in, in this uh, approach is to know uh, very well know uh, what is uh, doing the, the, the supervisor uh, entity and um, how they are uh, they are uh, uh, following the and um, 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 reaching the, the, the supervisor uh, expectatives. Uh, right now we have no uh, rules uh, for climate change uh, but uh, we are we are uh, working on a stress test uh, with the with the company who are uh, capturing some information and, and talking a lot with them so in these first steps uh, there are more uh, carrots than sticks <laughs> i mean uh, uh, the risk is there uh, the climate change won't won't give us a suddenly uh, 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 um, an event uh, that uh, put everything uh, everything uh, in the bad way uh, uh, that, that is um, not too slow but but but, but we, we we have changed to to implant this uh, this new regulation and this new new vision uh, in, in our in our uh, in our markets uh, but uh, I, I, I think it, it is, uh, we, we have a, a goal that is to uh, have those uh, things uh, more uh, development uh, for in, in three, four years and have a more clear picture about what will be the carrots and 
what will be the sticks because uh, of course they will uh, affect the, the the solvency and the and the, and the uh, capital requirements that that that, that that's a, a real uh, solution but not in the short short term yeah. well uh, and the reality is the longer you wait the uh, there's an easier conversion of the carrot to the stick, right? Because uh, then you have to compel people. So uh, I want to turn to Anur. And Anur, this is a question from our anonymous attendee. I like to call them courageous anonymous, right? They're very courageous. They don't put their name down. But uh, the question is an interesting one. It could be a bit of a grenade, but nonetheless, it's a legitimate question. It's, uh, you know, you talked about pensions and all that. So in a low interest rate uh, context that we live in now, it seems difficult to justify environmental haircuts against the payout of pension investors and savers. How uh, do you, not you so much, but how do you justify uh, that for your policy over, uh, overseers, uh, economic ministry or equivalent? Like, what is that conversation? Give us a flavor of that conversation in Iceland. I'm sure it's come up. Someone's worked all their life, they're ready to retire, then someone says, sorry, you can't be investing in all these companies because of environmental concerns. Now what? <clears throat> um, we, we're not very advanced in this as yet. We know that, uh, it, it, we know that in some, some uh, other OECD countries, there, there are divisions in pension funds that uh, people can opt uh, volunt voluntarily for that uh, that invest uh, solely in in green green products so they so the 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 pension fund um, the, the 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 member of the pension fund the the he, he it decides for himself what risk shall be taken in in this respect also for for the for the um, profits. So this might be sort of the democratic way forward in this. We have not yet taken this discussion uh, here in, in Iceland, uh, maybe within in, in the say in the in the pension funds, but they are obligatory in Iceland. Uh, it's a legal uh, duty and uh, to to be a member of a pension fund and pay uh, pay into that so and and usually people cannot choose the pension fund itself so that makes uh the, the ones who manage them um, more it's more stringent that that they can, they cannot they cannot have uh, people cannot choose between green or brown or or risk taking and such so so i think the future would be maybe to have to make this more to disclose it to to make this more obvious um and then there's one point that has been taken also in this discussion is that well uh, as such important uh, investors the pension funds can they can if they if they decide to to invest in in, in brown business uh, they can they can turn it over because they they are they, if, if they are of, of a certain size they they are so influential that they can really affect the, the, the so so um, so so they are they, the, the, we 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 can see, I, I I think that we will see some changes in this respect but as yet we are still very much fixed on on the on the profit margin of the investments of the funds so we're not as advanced as I would like to be able to tell you today, but we're looking into these uh, aspects. It's a, it's a big issue because uh, on the one hand, yes, uh, pension funds have a lot of opportunity to influence change and they bring the muscle of their investments, but they also have pension obligations. They have fiduciary responsibility. They can't just walk away from that. So I can see that being a very tough problem and a tough challenge. Um, I want to ask a question. I want to, we, we have limited time and I want to address it to each of you to give your views on it. There are some skeptics out there in the supervisory community that say, well, you know, all this stuff about climate change fine is very important. But at the end of the day, supervisors really cannot take their eye off financial stability and credit problems because they do that, you know, and then they chase these trends, then they get distracted. 
What's your answer to them, uh, uh, Onur? And then I'll go to Thomas. Um, well, it, 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 it depends on how long far-sighted you want to be. In the end of the day, I assume uh, we need alignment between the, uh, the, the dangers that the climate change is, is imminent and, 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 the, and the risk. So, so uh, I, I think we are, we, we're seeing things happening uh, quite rapidly nowadays, but it's, it's, it's not a long time that we are, are into this. So in the end of the day, I think it's um, uh, for financial stability, it's, it's really crucial that uh, we don't, uh, we, we're not careless about how, how, how the businesses are run and how they're financed. So uh, I think that in the long run, uh, this will be align aligned. Thank you. And Tomas, you've been a um, trailblazing leader in Costa Rica on these issues and being a leader sometimes can be very lonely. I'm sure you've heard these skeptics from different agencies and others talk about that. What is your answer to them in, in one minute? <laughs> I, um, I have no uh, a complete answer right now. Uh, that is because uh, we have uh, divided the, the financial supervision and, and that is an, an issue in our country. Uh, but uh, uh, this is a, 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 a hot trend topic right now in Costa Rica, uh, where uh, we, we, we just uh, uh, built the, the working group uh, with central bank and and the supervisor, and I, 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 I think we will talk a lot, a lot uh, about this, 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 this topic in the near future. Um, we are just now uh, finishing, not finishing. We are in the middle of the of the final of the of the pandemic. I, I, I think, uh, and there are uh, some risks that, that that we must to 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 balance uh, in, in our uh, financial market and so on. Uh, uh, these new uh, uh, challenges uh, must be calibrated and must be put in the, in the, in the, in the, in the growing path uh, for, for the near future. Uh, I, I'm totally sure. Excellent, thank you. So this it just gives me a great pleasure to bring this session to an end. We had uh, people from 46 different countries attending almost all letters of the alphabet from uh, B, Barbados to Zimbabwe. So I don't know what happened to Argentina. And I think, uh, uh, Thomas, you're gonna have to talk to your colleagues there and, and Anguilla and also elsewhere. But uh, you talked about the issues in a very good uh, measured way. I have a, a lot of respect for you as two jurisdictions that are small, but really are punching above your weight in this and you're influencing regional and international discussions. Hope you're not going to be a stranger and participate in other trauma center programs. So thank you very much. Uh, you did great and namaste. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice being with you. Bye.